Hello and welcome to Unpacking Articles. The article we're going to unpack today is called Rethinking and Shifting Discourses and Practices of Testing from Accuracy to Engagement with Situated Contexts. And even though this chapter focuses on language programs at the university level, the ideas we're going to unpack are applicable or relatable to many different contexts. The article talks about written tests in particular, since they are probably the most traditional form of testing in language programs. And the question at the core of this article to me is, how can we make written tests more communicative? The authors begin by pointing out some issues with traditional written tests, namely that they tend to be guided by the textbook to the point that it feels very constraining. Students are expected to learn specific words and say things in a specific way. And so the purpose of the assessment becomes all about determining how much of the chapter content the students can remember. So they tend to be all about declarative knowledge and accuracy. It's all about correctly applying rules or explicit knowledge, knowledge about the language, as opposed to using the language for a communicative purpose. And they also tend to be limited to responses that can either be correct or incorrect. And that's supposed to ensure objectivity on the part of the instructor. You assign a grade based on how many items they got right, and that's that. But there's clearly a mismatch. Language is about creativity, not conformity. As Larson Freeman pointed out in the article that we unpacked in episode 14, language is subjective, meaningful, contextualized, purposeful. But is that really reflected in our assessments? As the authors point out in this quote, both the instruction and assessment should reflect that premise. They say, if instructional practices focus on meaning-making processes by giving learners freedom to choose content and language use in their responses to prompts, then written tests should also evaluate learners' use of language for their own subjective communicative needs. And you see that word, subjective, because they want to contrast with the objectivity of correct, incorrect responses. And so the authors worked together to revise their assessment practices in the introductory language courses for three language programs, Spanish, French, and German. Okay, so let's look at all the changes they made. They changed the names of the assessments. They incorporated more projects and reduced the number of tests. They changed the questions to be open-ended and contextualized. To the extent possible, they avoided doing one test per chapter. And of course, they changed the grading criteria. All of these steps are pieces of a bigger puzzle. Just by themselves are not enough. Let's unpack them one by one. First, changing the name of the assessments might seem trivial, but it could actually have a big impact in terms of how they're perceived. So I'm glad they mentioned that. Now, the authors do acknowledge that perhaps the names could be better. They were trying to convey checking for their learning as opposed to testing. But to me, the Spanish option, at least, still very much conveys this notion of a test. So I wish the names had been more removed from connotations of traditional testing. But again, I do think it's a good idea to consider what you call your tests or your assessments. I also do applaud the idea of replacing some tests with projects, such as stories, presentations, blogs, etc. This clearly underscores prioritizing application over memorization. The question that arises is, why keep any tests? Why not replace all the tests with projects? The authors indicate that it would have been too radical of a change. What I would say is that unassisted and relatively spontaneous performance has a place in our courses. If one of our goals is to help learners develop communicative ability in the target language so that they can accomplish communicative tasks on their own, then I don't see anything wrong with assessing what they can do on their 
own. I think that projects have value and I think that spontaneous unassisted performance also has value. The other change the authors made to the written test had to do with the types of questions asked. They shifted from focusing on correct use of structures to situated open-ended answers. And this was supposed to give students more subjective control, as they say, in terms of what to write. As much as I love open-ended answers, I think it's important to distinguish between format and meaningfulness. At one point in the article, when they are describing their new tests, the authors say, and I quote, there are no items focused solely on measuring accurate declarative knowledge, such as multiple choice, true, false, or one word fill in the blank exercises. That statement seems to be equating multiple choice with measuring accurate declarative knowledge. But just because a question is multiple choice, that doesn't mean it is focusing on declarative knowledge. For instance, you can have a great comprehension question, a great inference question that is multiple choice and has nothing to do with selecting the correct form or the correct vocab word. And by the same token, just because it's open-ended, that doesn't mean it is not about accuracy or that it doesn't focus on declarative knowledge. You can have the students write five examples of a particular verb tense and in your grading, maybe that is all you're focusing on, then yeah, it's an open-ended item that focuses on declarative knowledge. So we need to be careful with thinking that the format leads to a better test. And on a similar note, I don't agree with the author's implication that one test per chapter is necessarily an indication of traditional form-focused testing. I can see perhaps that it could make it a little harder psychologically to move away from testing whatever the textbook covered. But that's really the key issue here, not the number of tests that you have. You can have a fantastic, meaningful, purposeful test at the end of every chapter. So one test per chapter is not necessarily the problem. I do fully agree with the authors that changing the grading criteria is absolutely crucial. And I also agree with them that the grading criteria should be about successful communication and not memorization. Now, there are some remaining challenges. The first one, which is something that the authors acknowledge, is the challenge of engaging with enough cultural authenticity or relevance. The questions in the new test still focused a lot on just language and basic communication. Remember that this is the introductory sequence. And the authors also underscore how difficult it is to engage in deeper reflection when the priority is given to target language use. The students in the introductory sequence don't have the linguistic skills to engage in deeper cultural reflection in the target language. And in this quote, they open up the possibility to perhaps changing some of that. It says, it is possible that the written test's exclusive use of the target language to promote development of linguistic abilities is to the detriment of engaging critical explorations and reflections. The other challenge I see, and it's not something that the authors point out, is that even though the questions are open-ended, they are still relatively traditional. For example, this is one of the questions on the Spanish exam that the authors provided. It says, choose a picture, and they're shown two clip art or stock images, and write five sentences using at least three words from the list. And they're given a word bank with specific words or phrases they need to use. When I read that, I immediately thought of a quote that appeared earlier in the article criticizing traditional tests. It says, with no purpose other than providing accurate answers, learners perform mechanical exercises for the sake of the test, but they do not engage with test items on a level that may be meaningful to them. Now, I fully agree with that critique when it comes to traditional tests, but then I think about this particular example of writing five sentences using at least three words from a list. 
Writing five sentences describing a picture may not be a mechanical exercise, but it still feels like language protection for the sake of the test. So is that inevitable? And that also makes me wonder if maybe it's a side effect of using a textbook. If you recall from episode 19, this is precisely one thing that Tomlinson, the author of that article, criticized about textbooks. Even when students are given more freedom, there's no audience or purpose. It is just, and here comes my favorite phrase, for the sake of the test. So is it inevitable? That's the question. Let's imagine other possibilities. And these are just my ideas. Now we're going beyond the article. What if there was a culminating writing task and every written test constituted one paragraph or one section of that larger writing task. For example, writing an email to an exchange student who's coming to their school. They can start talking a little bit about themselves. They talk about their classes, a typical day, what they do in their free time, what their town is like, all the things that students usually learn in first year courses. And as they learn them, they add a paragraph or a short section to that email. That would give the course more cohesion because they're working towards this one concrete goal that they'll be able to accomplish by the end of the course. And it would also allow for revisiting and revising what they have written. Right now, in the vast majority of tests, the students write something, the instructor grades them, and that's it. Nobody goes back to revise it. Nobody goes back to expand it. And so perhaps if we saw all of these written tests as puzzle pieces that are building this culminating writing task, then they would be revisiting what they wrote before. Okay, if that sounds too ambitious, <laughs> what if at the very least the written test was part of class activities? In other words, what if they write something as the test and that serves a purpose other than the assessment itself? For example, in step one, you tell them to write five sentences describing their personality traits and their likes and dislikes. In a way, I guess it's very similar to what the authors have been talking about, right? More subjectivity, more personal expression. Okay, but let's not end there. Instead, use that as part of an activity. So here comes step two. A classmate is going to read what they wrote and they're going to recommend a career path based on their traits as well as what they like and dislike. And then in step three, the original student who wrote the sentences in step one could confirm if that's the career path that they have chosen or if that's what they want to do when they grow up. And so this way, the language produced in step one is not just an assessment. It's not just a test. It has an audience and a purpose. Someone else will do something with that information. And yes, you can still assess it and grade it as if it were a test or a quiz. My point is that we need to start seeing instruction and assessment as one and the same. And that is indeed the takeaway. Instruction and assessment need to reflect each other. And we, as educators, need to reflect on both. That's just my take on it. As usual, I encourage you to read the original and draw your own conclusions. Thank you for tuning in and until next time.